I've never been able to wear a Mississippi State flag, or I've never been able, you know, I've never had a, but I'm excited because my daughter, like my daughter's grown up, she'll, have, she'll be able to like fly a flag that represents her. This is TSN In Depth. I'm Rick Westhead, joined by Toronto Blue Jays player, Anthony Alford. Anthony, thanks for joining us. And I, I'd love to hear your sense for how training camp and how being back on the field feels so far. It feels good. Um, after a few months of no baseball, um, it was weird being at home around um, that time of the year while we was quarantining. Um, but it, it definitely feels good to be back. Um, refreshing. Um, I mean, just, you know, just some kind of sense of normalcy. Some of the best players in the game, players like David Price and Buster Posey, aren't going to play. How close, or did you entertain that possibility of not playing this year? I can't say it didn't cross my mind, but, like, I mean, let's be real, they're in a totally different position career-wise than I am. I mean, I understand, like, Buster Posey, like, he's, he's adopting two twin babies, I think, who's not fully developed, or they were born premature. Everybody's doing what's best for them and their family in this situation, you know. And I feel like that's what I'm doing right now. I got to do what's best for me and my family. So, so Anthony, you've, you've got an up and close view of the healthcare system in the United States recently, having a daughter born in the midst of a pandemic. What, what was that experience like? Well, it was rough because she was born 28 weeks and three days. Um, and with the, during the whole pandemic, it's, it just made it like that much tougher because at first I didn't even know if I was going to be in there with my wife while she was born because of all of the rules they have with this whole COVID-19. The thing that was more scarier for me was, okay, what if I was to somehow get COVID just but even though I'm taking the right precautions, what if I was to somehow contract COVID and and not even know it and then go be around her? So like that was the that was something that was always in the back of my mind. Do you want to talk about how much she weighed when she was born and when you got to hold her for the first time and what that was like? So when she was first born, um, obviously her body wasn't fully developed, but she was like she was two pounds four ounces. I could just hold in my hand like this. She was like so small. And when they brought her out, they put in a Ziploc bag, like to keep her warm or the humidity or something. But it was weird seeing them put my baby in a Ziploc bag. Boy, did you ever jump into the deep end of parenting right away? I know, right? Tell me a little bit about the community where you grew up. I grew up in this small town called Columbia, Mississippi. Um, I grew up, it's a community called Lampton. Um, in government housing, advanced staff in the apartments. I thought it was fun to grow up there because there was a lot of kids around, a lot of people for me to play with. And you don't really, as a kid, you don't realize how poor you are. Can you remember when you first realized that the state flag of Mississippi had the Confederate emblem in it and what that represented? Pretty much my whole life. Um, but it, it never really stuck out to me until until I moved to, um, so I, what I, I moved from Columbia to Petal, which is like completely opposite of what I just described to you, um, to to play baseball and football there, and and I would see like these these guys, they would like have like a big Confederate flag like flying on that truck, like they're in the big trucks, like jacked up with loud pipes and the flag flying. And I just looked at it like, bro, these dudes are crazy, you know, like, but I went from a 98%, 98% black school to an 85% white school. Those guys who like fly the flags on the back of their truck and they all like to meet at uh, Walmart parking lot and just gather around, you know, like those type of people. I've always known that it was, it was a sign of hate for me. What do, you, what do you mean by that? The, the Confederate flag, it, what does it symbolize to you? Well, to me, it symbolizes hate. You know, uh, you think about the people who wore that flag and, and fought for that flag. And, um, like, what was they fighting for? You know, it was fighting to keep Black people slaves. 
How do you feel about the state flag being changed and about that emblem being removed from it? For 26 years of my life, I've never been able to wear a Mississippi state flag or I've never been able, you know, I've never had a, but I'm excited because my daughter, like my daughter's grown up, she'll, have, she'll be able to like fly a flag that represents her as well, you know, like and be proud of it. As bad as I want to say that they did it for the right reasons, but I mean, I know why they really took the flag down because it was it was going to come to it was going to come to um, them losing money with SEC saying that they won't host any championship games unless the flag comes. If they would, if the, I think if the SEC never said that, then we'll still have that flag up. You feel like it was about money, maybe the same way as the Washington Redskins changed their name only after. Corporate sponsors said that they'd walk away if they didn't. That's a language that everybody understands is money. I know for years and years and years, we've been trying to get the flag changed. And in Mississippi, we have the highest percentage of African-Americans in, in the country. Like we have 40, it's 40%, it's 60, 40 split. Um, but we've been trying to get that flag changed for the longest and we just never could win the votes. But when the SEC came out and said they wasn't going to host any S any championship games in Mississippi until the flag is changed, and the running back from Mississippi State said he's not playing for Mississippi State unless the flag is changed. And they thought he was going to possibly start losing recruits in, in the state of Mississippi. Like, okay, you lose these recruits, then you're losing money, you know? Uh, and nobody want to lose money. Anthony, so many... Um black and indigenous you know people of color have stories about brushes with law enforcement um have you had experiences that way uh that have shaped your life so i was in high school but it was me one of my best friends and my girlfriend who was my wife now and this police just gets behind us and pull us over doesn't <clears throat> really tell his wife pull us over he doesn't really he asked for he asked for my license and um, but he pretty much just started asking, do we have anything illegal in the car? Is there drugs? Are there weapons? Anything illegal in the car? I told him no. And he just kept pressing that he wanted to search the car. Um, I didn't have a problem with it, obviously, because I had nothing to hide. So I figured, okay, you search the car, you let me go on about my business um, because it's kind of late. So get out the car he just strip search my car throw stuff on the ground um pull stuff out my trunk just leave it on the ground and then he's pretty much like after he finished he just said have a nice day and it was just like man this dude's an asshole like that was my first initial reaction but like who, who would do that to like some teenage kids you know anthony this week the u.s president in an interview with cbs news was asked why it is that so many black people are dying after encounters with law enforcement. And the US president, his response was that white people are dying as well. A lot of, a lot of white people are dying. How does that make you feel? How does that make you feel to hear that kind of a message from your president? I used to get offended when I heard stuff, because, you know, um, but I think I would get offended because the people who call themselves Christians like embrace that kind of behavior, you know, like, oh, he's the best thing since the slice of bread. Like you just, they just love Donald Trump, but like, but you, you built on Christian morals and um, you say you believe in the Bible, but you, but you embrace everything that this man says. It's like he tried to justify why black people are being killed, like by saying stuff like, well, white people are being killed too. That's just like people saying, well, black lives matter. So no, all lives matter. Well, we didn't say all lives didn't matter, but all lives isn't affected by police brutality right now. For decades, there have been moments where it felt like uh, society was going to go through fundamental changes for the better. And now with Black Lives Matter, I wonder if this one is sustainable and if it's different from some of the other moments in history. I am hopeful, but I know in order for things to change, it's gonna take like us putting the right people in leadership positions in order for them to be able to, you know, change different right policies and 
pass different bills and pass different laws. Um, like that's what it's gonna take. So it's gonna take like black people coming out to vote and everybody else coming out to vote and putting those the right people in leadership positions because if you have somebody like Trump in every state leading your community, then it's not like that's I'm not very hopeful with that, you know.